I always love reading feedback and comments, and I've got one this time from Lucia who asks if Alteryx can zip a file and email it. And she's actually a subscriber too, see that little icon there? Yes, Alteryx can do that, and I'm gonna walk you through it here. The video previously to this one was actually kind of the prequel, and that was where I use the block until done tool, and I'm using it here. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend you go back and watch that real quick, super fast, less than four minutes, and you can see that tool in action. Here I'm going to skip, for the most part, my explanation about the block until done tool, and we'll just go on and talk through how the run command tool works. So that's the tool we're going to use and focus on uh, for this particular video, and you'll get an understanding of how you can zip a file and email it. Now what's cool about the run command tool is pretty much any other program that you have installed on your computer, or in most cases, you're probably going to send this out to a server and be part of the gallery and have it run there. Any program that's installed there that has a command line interface can be run using the run command tool. Now, this tool is a little bit complicated, so I've got the workflow already built out on my screen. I'm going to click on the tool here and talk you through a little bit about the setup. So. I'm using it in the most difficult way possible, and I'm doing that intentionally. The tool can be used in three different ways. It can be used as an input tool, it can be used as an output tool, and it can be used as an intermediary tool, which is how I'm using it now. When you're using it in its intermediary form, you must have an input and an output, okay? If you look at the configuration page, you'll see that it says a source is optional and a read result is optional. Now, the term optional here is a little bit misleading. If you're using it as an intermediary tool, then both of those are not optional. They're actually required. Now, if, if using it as an input tool or an output tool, tool doesn't make sense to you, let me show it to you real quick. So I'm, I'm clicked on the tool here. If I go ahead and I delete the line that's going into the tool, then I'm using the run command tool as input at this point, okay? In which case, uh, I would need to identify uh, what is going to be read as input. Now, if I put that line back and I remove the line from the right side, then the tool becomes an output tool. It's going to terminate here, which at that point then I need to have a right source what's going to be output. So this tool, although it seems very complicated, is really versatile because it can be input, it can be output, and you can use it within your data flow. Well, now, let's talk about its intermediary form, which is how I'm using it. And what's, what's interesting about this form, and I love this about the tool, and I actually wish, to some extent, almost all of the tools had this capability. When it's in its intermediary form, I can take data in, run a command and then output data and continue on my way. I really like that about this particular tool, but it makes it a little bit tricky. So let's back up to the actual workflow here and talk about it. I'm using an Excel file as input. It has 10,000 rows of data, all right? And I'm using the block until done tool. You can go back and, and see how that tool works. The first output of that tool is that I'm going to write to a CSV file, and it's just going to a temp folder, and it's called 10kdiabetesarchive.csv. Now the block until done tool will not process the second stream until the first one is done. So the file's written, it's closed, it's available for use, and now I'm going on to the second stream. And in that second stream, I'm using a summary tool just to count the number of records that are being processed. And then I'm using the run command tool. And the way that I have this set up is I am going to run a batch file. Okay, now this isn't a video about a batch file. I can create one if you want to learn about how to create batch files, which is interesting. Leave comments if you want me to do that. I'm happy to do it. But I'm really not going to dive into how a batch file is created. I'm going to show you the code, but that's about it. Okay, that batch file is going to run a program called 7-zip which is so somewhat equivalent to WinZip, which is the question Lucia was asking. So 7-zip is going to take as input the output file, the CSV file, and create a .zip file from that particular file, okay? Now, what makes this interesting about the intermediary is because it has an input and an output, I need to tell it what it's going to read. And so for this, I just created what I call a placeholder file, which is this zip 
uh, diabetesfile.txt. It's a fake file. And then the output that it's going to write is the exact same name. You'll notice that it's the same. And the output is going to be the summary, basically the count of records uh, that it created, and that would be available in the Browse tool at the end. Uh, now, if you were going to do this truly as an intermediary tool, whatever sort of process you used in the run command, the assumption would be you need the output of that particular command in subsequent parts of your workflow. That would be the process. Here, it's sort of a, a dummy setup just to show you the most extreme, more complicated version of being able to use this tool. You do have two additional options here. You can run the command minimized. A window will open, but it will be minimized. Or you can run silent, where no uh, command line window will pop up at all while this is being run. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave both those unchecked so you can see what that what that looks like. Now, let's talk about that batch file just for a minute so you can understand uh, the process behind that here. So here's the zip diabetes file dot bat. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through coding batch files, but in essence, what I'm doing is I'm calling win, calling 7-zip, which is a program freely available that you can download. And that program is installed in program files slash 7-zip uh, and then 7z.exe is the executable program. Now, you'll notice it's in double quotes. That's because there is a space between the name program and files, and so that needs to be in quotes. If there's no space in the directory or file path, like there isn't one here, then it doesn't have to be in quotes. I'm also using an A command here, an A switch, that tells it that I want to add this file to an archive, the CSV file, and I want to name the archive diabetes.zip. Now, how did I know how to do that, right? Where did I get this from? Well, the WinZip program itself, sorry, not WinZip, 7-zip program itself, when you install it, will come with a help menu and you can go to contents and you can see the command line version of this particular application and the commands that are available. In this case, I want to add a file to an archive or create a new archive, and it tells me exactly the code that I need to be able to create that particular archive. There's also some information about doing things with wildcards and, and directories and all of that, so it's available in there too. Okay, Again, not a video about creating zip files necessarily from command line, but it's tied to the run command tool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and walk through the rest of the setup here on running this external program. So I have the batch file set up, the, the .bat file. I also need to tell it where I want to run the program that's going to create this particular zip file. And in this case, because 7-zip is installed in program files and 7-zip, in fact, you can click browse and go find the directory where that's located, that's where it will run. There's one caveat here. If you have modified the variables within your Windows installation, then you can run 7-zip.exe from any directory. In this case, I haven't added it to my variables that are available to be run as programs in any directory, so I need to specify where that program is going to be run. All right, at that point, that's all I need to do, and the zip file will run will run just fine, or the batch file will run, and it will zip the file. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the directory where that file is located so you can see it. Remember, I said it was in my temp directory, and the CSV file is there, and the batch file is located there as well, but there's no zip file there yet, and that, that's because I haven't run my workflow. When I run it, the zip file will be created. The last piece to this is this, this block until done, create the file, run the batch job that zips the file, and then the last piece is to email the file off, okay? Now, I have a separate video on how to email. If you watch the prequel video to this, you can go out and find out how, exactly how to do it. I always repeat the same caveat over and over again. Remember that the email tool will run as many times as there are input records. So make sure there's only one input record and then one email will be generated unless that particular input has all of the names of the emails you want to send. I usually send to a distribution list, so it's not a problem. It's so a common question I get is, how come it sent 10,000 emails, right? There's 10,000 records. So it, it ran for every single record inside the data set. When I was testing this, the same thing happened with the batch file. It ran the batch file 10,000 times. That's because there were 10,000 records coming through, and so I'm using a summary tool just to count the records. 
So at the end of this, I would expect that there would be a zip diabetes file.txt that contains the number 10,000 and the word count in it because that's what I'm doing prior to running the batch command. And then the batch file itself, based on the code that I showed you, is going to create an archive in my temp folder called diabetes.zip. Okay, that's what I would expect. Now, I'm not gonna run the email portion of this because I don't, I don't want it to, to email anything out. In fact, I just created a fake SMTP placeholder for this. You know, this is never gonna run or work, um, but it's, it's there as part of the example. Again, watch my email video and you can see how that works. So let's go ahead and run it. And you may see that, that black uh, command window pop up that tells me that I actually ran the command. And then when I go over to um, the temp folder and I refresh this here, you'll see there's a diabetes.zip file, which is what I would expect, and the archive file is listed in there. That's exactly what I would, would expect to see. The only error we get is that inside the email tool, um, I left the from and to fields empty. You can make those more dynamic if you have some data you're going to input into there, or you can just input the email address of who you want to send it to. Now, I will admit, doing the email example this way isn't the ideal way. That's why I recommend you take time to, to learn how to do that email piece on your own. All right, I'm going to leave it there. This was a really, really good suggestion from Lucia. I appreciate the feedback and comments. If there are other aspects to this workflow that you want to learn about, for example, if you're really interested in learning about batch files, I'm happy to do that. I usually only do videos on Power BI and Alteryx, but I'm happy to dive into that as well. Uh, and leave some comments here about what else you like to see. As always, I like to pick those comments and make them the next content. So until next time, see you then.